Can you see? Can you see? Yes, we see okay. and hear. That's wonderful. And hear. Perfect. Okay. Well, uh, good evening. Uh, it's uh, almost three o'clock. Uh, three o'clock in the morning here in Singapore. Uh, I'm talking now. Nice continuation from uh, transcriptomics. Uh, skipping one step and then we end up with the metabolites. And, uh, one moment. So yeah, the, the, the package or the talk will be about small molecules. So small molecules, just a quick overview are made, of course metabolites. Metabolites includes also the lipids and also includes uh, signaling molecules. And uh, what also becomes more and more relevant is the natural products. So secondary metabolites from plants, uh, microbiome. And then we also have the drugs uh, that are uh, measured also in the same approach uh, often. Uh, and uh, uh, now we have, uh, uh, you see here up there, you see uh, clinical measured uh, in the first uh, row there, you see clinically measured uh, uh, compounds here, especially focusing on lipids because our lab is worked mostly on lipids. And we see here, for example, the total cholesterol. Uh, we see here the triglycerides. So if you go to a doctor and he does a lipid panel, he will measure uh, these two compounds. And these are total compositions. But if we then look more in detail, these are the triglycerides that are uh, measured in the common uh, mass spectrometry platforms. So we, we found around 30 or depending on the methods, even up to 100 different triglycerides. And the same is also for the cholesterol. Cholesterol is a mix between uh, esterified and non-esterified cholesterol. And the question is, uh, uh, is the total cholesterol more, uh, gives you more value than the individual compounds or maybe a, a subset of the individual lipid species? So the clinical application or the translational uh, uh, research that is being done, uh, it is uh, metabolomics and lipidomics focuses basically screening for uh, screenings uh, for new biomarker, biomarker discovery. And then maybe ideally uh, in future, we will also have um, multi-metabolite um, or analyte panels, like a few or tens or hundreds. And that maybe gives you a, a fingerprint of a uh, health hey, or disease status. And then what this omics or metabolomics studies also reveal is the new diseases or mechanisms in health and those in diseases. So here you really see a map here of uh, lipids that are measured in one single uh, mass spec run. Uh, sometimes we, end up, we can measure around 500 species uh, depending on the approach. But this doesn't reflect by far the reality. So we measure some of compositions. And so in reality, there's much more behind it. But you can already see the complexity and that this may just a quick overview of what is the mass spectrometry or how do we do that? So uh, we, one key word is here, we try to reduce the complexity of the samples. So we take plasma, we extract the lipids, get rid of some of the uh, yeah, water soluble compounds. Then we make a chromatography, we separate uh, them depending on some properties. And then it goes to mass spectrometry. Um, basically we have here two, two mass filters, which can select uh, specific molecules with a specific mass and they go into a chamber. And then we we'll collide with uh, nitrogen and then break into fragments here. Uh, and then the fragments are characteristics for the molecule that we want to measure. And we can measure the uh, abundance of the accounts. And this will give us raw data from some here in, in the targeted uh, approach, MRM here, gives us uh, raw data in form of a chromatogram. And the big question is, or the big challenge is uh, how to process such data and how to look at uh, which peak is which one and how to automatically uh, fit this. And then from this step, there's another step uh, from these peak areas is uh, the calculation of concentrations. And this is exactly the part where I'm talking about. This is from the processed raw uh, raw, raw data to intermediate uh, data that uh, still needs to be uh, like peak areas that has to be further processed. And just give you an, an overview about our lab uh, or about how we work and what are our, our challenges. So we, we are situated in a university, but also closely work together with, um, uh, with hospitals uh, uh, in Singapore and uh, around the world. And we measure cohorts, sample cohorts, clinical trials, smaller studies, and also mice models, and sometimes even uh, plants and uh, and virus uh, samples and like this. So we have a big diversity in projects uh, also, uh, and that also is reflected down in the scales. 
So we measure uh, between four, we have panels, we only measure four specific lipids, but we also have panels where we can quantify around 600 lipids. And this for uh, very small studies, like a, rare, a patient comes with a rare disease and we try to do some work, five samples, but uh, nowadays we have cohorts that uh, reach, uh, sorry, it's one zero too much here, but maybe that's the real future, what I wrote here. So currently we have cohorts that go to 5,000 or 10,000 or even uh, actually close to 30,000, uh, 50,000. And we have various tissues, mostly plasma, uh, and we use different methods. We have established methods. We have new methods that are under development where we maybe still try to apply them to some studies. And we are uh, trying to implement uh, published or novel methods completely new from the scratch. And we have different platforms, and the same is also different analytic platforms that differ in the way the data uh, looks like. And we also have tools, uh, different tools, open source and the vendor specific tools to process the data, uh, to do exploratory data analysis, statistical analysis, and then for the data processing that I will talk about, uh, there's a big diversity in the lab, uh, Excel, R, and uh, yeah, some shiny apps that we have developed. And now coming a little bit to the challenges from our lab. So uh, we have uh, many people, but we also have a lot of, uh, our lab is called Incubator because we also harbor uh, host many uh, visitors and students. And that gives a, a huge or quite a big diversity in, in, in terms of scope uh, from biologists to really analytic chemists that we have background and experience. And uh, what we more and more see is that, especially because the number of data, uh, bioinformaticians and statisticians in our group is relatively small. Uh, what we see here is the communication between the bio biologists and the biochemists, the analysts, those who really do the work in the lab and really see what the instrument is doing, the bioinformaticians, and then the statisticians, this communication and the workflow and the, uh, the, you know, how we deal with this is, is becomes more and more of a challenge. And, uh, and this challenge uh, reflects down in data quality, in the reproducibility and the consistency, but also uh, what especially is lacking uh, when the data is passed from an analyst to a bioinformatician and there's almost no communication between them. We basically uh, often miss the chance to learn from the data, like something goes wrong with the, with the analysis or something looks a little bit weird. Of course, we can apply batch and drift corrections, all this is fine. But uh, maybe we, if we really look carefully at the data, we can maybe, uh, or we will be able to see uh, artifacts or uh, system uh, issues or actually process problems that we can improve when there's a, a constant feedback. And then there's also the issue that many uh, analysts and bio, uh, bio, uh, sorry, biochemists, they, they produce their data. And because the large amount of the data, the complexity, like 100,000 or million of data points, uh, they really are dependent on uh, having someone who analyzes the data. And then it starts again, the communication, and can you do this plot for me? Can you uh, look at that? And, uh, and so, and then, so what we are asking is how can we improve this process? And strategies are, of course, we could develop software tools, uh, shiny apps that people can use, uh, upload their data, they get something back. Uh, that's one um, possibility, but this, this has limits. Uh, so there's a, especially due to our uh, diversity of projects. Some people might uh, have a special case or they want to plot, and suddenly a fixed program tool like a shiny app will not be able to do this. And then the, the workaround is often go back either to Excel or really to from scratch start with data analysis to, to analyze those specific cases. And uh, well, so we, we are trying now to uh, train people, uh, biochemists, uh, and students uh, a little bit with R but, uh, and uh, this is on the right side we have here from a conference, a workshop that I organized together with uh, uh, Professor Hume Won Choi, uh, where we really go through a published paper and really analyze the data without actually any external packages, just to the tidy words mostly, and then the statistical part to uh, uh, standard, uh, standard protocol, uh, standard uh, packages. We really try to uh, go through the people uh, from really peak areas to the final results of the publication. Um, but when we realize these workshops and we sit together with our people in the lab, we see that there's limits to this. Uh, so you, because they are just not able to really catch up uh, work, uh, learning R beside the normal work. And then they maybe will have one month, no time to look at R, they come back, they start again the procedure. 
So the idea is a little bit to create a package now that uh, helps uh, me, uh, my colleagues, my implementation colleagues, and the colleagues in the lab to analyze data, uh, like a common platform where we can uh, handle the data, share the data, and uh, that can be easily enhanced and improved uh, uh, for us. And so this is now uh, online at the moment, uh, but I have to say that it's still uh, not uh, ready for production, but it's uh, mainly online for, uh, for sharing and for having some feedback. And the idea of this package is to, to collect data and, and manage metadata, especially the metadata is quite uh, complex. And to really capture this, uh, the internal version of this package will also be able to access our lab information system. So we can directly retrieve uh, sample associated metadata uh, that explains on the analytical side, but also on the subject side uh, directly from the limbs. And we want to be uh, flexible in the way that we can analyze the data so we can apply different uh, batch corrections or uh, normalization strategies and filtering. But we want that these uh, are not uh, applied in a black box approach. So we want really to see what happens when I do a batch correction. Does the data really look better? Uh, do the CVs incre uh, increase? This can actually happen I mean, if we use normalization with internal standards to the, how does it look like? And we want it to be traceable. And then this uh, package should help us also in uh, reporting and sharing of the data, but not just uh, the data itself. And as my previous uh, speaker said, also to record the process, the process to the data. And that this is not just in a, in a, in a notebook somewhere, in our notebook, but that this is actually part of the data file that can be shared. And this library then will be used for people uh, in the lab uh, by bioinformaticians from us, and also uh, then serves as a base, a more robust base or maybe possible shiny apps or uh, other applications that uh, we use. And just go here through, actually, I prepared the Quarto uh, Reveal JS presentation, but at the final moment, still didn't really work to, to uh, go online, but I, luckily I have a PDF here. And so we, uh, it's called MIDAR, and uh, it creates an, an object that is uh, S4, so it's a little bit like Bioconductor, uh, package and we can uh, but uh, unlike most, most packages that exist for this similar field and uh, most of these packages are not really focusing on the real pre-processing of data especially handling a lot of metadata and really offering this flexibility so we have here our own s4 class where we can um, uh, for example uh, import direct uh, raw outputs from the instruments uh, computers uh, so there's no manual uh, uh, reformatting needed. That's what's really important for us that uh, in case we have to go back to the instrument, we can just export it again and reanalyze it. Um, and then we also can uh, import uh, metadata. Metadata can be plain text files, but uh, having uh, integrity of metadata so that they really match to the data, it's a surprisingly a ma massive challenge. So we have two systems. We have the limbs that is in, in we start to use the limbs more and more for certain things as a kind of a lab notebook. And then also a colleague of me, uh, a former colleague, uh, made an Excel uh, template macro based to really help people uh, annotate their data uh, based on their lab notes and uh, in Excel or even in the notebook to really make consistent and uh, data that are uh, keep the integrity. And then when we quickly look at the print method of this object, we will have a, 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 an overview of what, what is uh, important and not. And uh, it's unfortunately cut off here, but below we also have uh, an overview of which uh, processing steps have been applied. And then we can co uh, continue with this object and then we can apply, for example, a normalization with internal standards, which are uh, like uh, deuterated or uh, heavy labeled uh, standards that we spike in at the uh, sample as early as possible. So we normalize, then we quantitate based on the, the amount that we know of internal standard and maybe sample amounts, protein amounts. Uh, it will give me, it will give us immediately the uh, unit. So that's always a, a surprise, always again a surprising thing that often the unit with so much concentrate uh, calculations is a little bit confusing for people. And then uh, we can uh, calculate QC metrics that will then, uh, and this will allow us then to filter uh, the futures that we measure, which are lipids in this case, based on the analytical CV. Uh, for example, I can set a threshold of 20% uh, uh, percent CV here, a signal to blank ratio, and the linearity of the measurements when we do uh, dilution or uh, response curves. 
And then here we, it will gives you back an, an idea so that every step should give you back an idea of what happened to your data so that you're not blindly following something. And here we see that uh, our 400 measured futures, uh, we end up in 95 uh, futures, so only 25%. That's not good. So we can now do a batch correction. Uh, so first we, we correct for drifts. So we have here the option to do a drift corrections. There uh, will be a different uh, uh, algorithms there. And also here will give you a, a summary. Also, it will warn you of um, uh, any issues that uh, you might follow up. And then we do a, a, of this drift, we do a batch correction. And then yet we filter again. And now we see we have recovered 333 species. So uh, in, a, in a quite short time that usually when this is done in Excel, it's uh, only possible to a certain stage. And uh, if it's done by scripts, by bind conditions, uh, it still has to go again through all the processes. And uh, so it can really be done by the people itself in the lab and it's, it's also being done now. Uh, uh, so they have enough knowledge about our, our studio to run such simple things through. But uh, well, it's still kind of a black box. We have 300 spaces, but we don't know really how it looks like. So a big focus on this package is also on uh, really creating um, uh, outputs. And so there's a functions to really create uh, quality control plots that help us to understand uh, what is in the plots. And this is now an example here. So you can plot, uh, for example, intensity uh, over the runtime. And uh, you see here, uh, there's 200 samples, and you here see the different QC types in different colors. And in the yellow uh, bar on top there, uh, that's a way to uh, cap uh, uh, samples that are too high and would skew the whole plot so that we basically can focus on the most important thing, which is the QC analysis and look for some drifts. And indeed, we see here, this is uncorrected data. Uh, we see here really some batch effects here that happened uh, in the first, in the second, and the third batch. Uh, with these plots, uh, and uh, yeah, in, uh, in, uh, if I use Quarto uh, presentation, you can actually scroll through very nicely on the same page with scroll bars. So here we have it on different pages. And it can also be exported as a PDF. And we also uh, also are working on a shiny app to visualize this uh, in an efficient way, which is still quite of a challenge, uh, but uh, making some progress also there. And then uh, we are uh, now. So the idea is also that you can use these objects that are a plot. So for example, the ggplot objects that you can use them for your own things and customize it. So you have a base, you have the data you need, but you can continue to do your own. Uh, annotations of the plots, uh, make them ready for publication, or uh, maybe do some uh, own analysis for your specific case. And here uh, we see here the batch correction before and after uh, batch correction here. So you can plot it two times and store it in a variable, uh, and then you can just uh, continue this. And uh, not possible here because it's not interactive, this uh, PDF, but uh, you can just add this variable to a ggplotly. A function and you already get an interactive plot and you can see which samples are maybe your outliers. And then as a final stage uh, is the writing of a report. So uh, there's different options. One is the Excel report. This is in, in, uh, the moment active. There's also a, a PowerPoint uh, version because at the end PowerPoint is still uh, very acceptable by many people and can easily be shared. So with the QC plots and everything, but here is the, the, the Excel sheet which contains different sheets. One is an information sheet that contains information who has analyzed the data, when, uh, with which package version, and all the QC parameters that have been applied or QC steps. And then here you see the different QC uh, metrics uh, and then the final data sets that can then be used uh, by uh, internal groups or can then be shared with others. And then as a second thing, you can actually save this uh, S4 uh, object uh, as a, a serialized uh, file. And then you can actually uh, send it to someone else. You can open it even without the package. It's possible to open it. You see the different data sets. Uh, uh, they are quite uh, uh, still have to be worked on it a little bit, but they are quite readable. And then you can actually continue with uh, a lead uh, meter uh, to to process and to expect the data. So and uh, since all the information is stored from metadata to data, and all the processing steps are recorded. Basically, we have a fully reproducible uh, workflow uh, stored in one data uh, object file. And yeah, the next step is really to uh, make it uh, work on it and maybe get some user feedback and to uh, implement uh, that uh, plots that we use in the lab and functions that we use in the lab at the moment to export them to the public version. 
uh, and then uh, yeah, shiny app is also on the development uh, if time gives and yeah so i will stop here with a quick uh, thanks to uh, our lab uh, that is held by uh, professor markus wang and my colleagues who uh, constantly help uh, each other to to optimize these workflows in the lab and also a big thank you to the great conference. It's my first time I attend this conference. It's really an amazing conference. Uh, thank you very much. And um, yeah, open for any questions. Thank you, Dr. Berla. If you have any questions, please drop them into the chat. Um, I particularly love that um, in these in this kind of talk uh, that you began with, like giving us the details behind the science about what we're about to do. I, as someone who doesn't work with this data very often, I appreciated that a lot. And I also love that the, at the end, you get an encapsulated um, object with the entire workflow and the process uh, you know, being outlined there. I think that's fantastic. Yeah, I'm really uh, glad to have uh, feedback on this. And uh, of course, it's a big endeavor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we have um, a question from Luca. Do you plan on an extension uh, to untargeted uh, metablomics? Ooh. I'm not great at pronouncing words I've never said out loud before. Oh, uh, yeah, yes. Uh, is it, so this is for me, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, we, we also do untargeted lipidomics or metabolomics. Uh, and we, uh, yeah, we especially focus a little bit on ensuring that the, um, uh, the yeah, the identif uh, lipid or the metabolite identification and annotation is correct. So yeah, yeah, definitely. And I'm glad to, 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 uh, Look at data sets. Yeah. Our lab is also working on this, yes. That is fantastic. And we have mm -hmm. some other nice comments in the chat about the package people have used it. Um, so again, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Berlin. I, I hope yeah. you can uh, get some rest. Sure. Pretty yeah. early. 